A very warm welcome to the World Economic Forum DWTV debate coming to you from India in Delhi. It's widely recognized that our water resources are depleting much faster than we thought. A recent report suggests that in worldwide supply and demand, there'll be a gap of some 40% by 2030. In fact, in India, it'll be even more. The deficit is said to be up to 50% within 20 years. That's within our lifetime. India has 16% of the world's population, but only 4% of its water resources. So how does India avert a water crisis? To discuss this, we have a very eloquent panel here for you. People who at various levels are engaged in water issues, and from what I can make out, also share a passion for finding solutions. Arjun Thapan is a infrastructure and water advisor, special advisor to the president of the Asian Development Bank in Manila. Ajit Gulabchand is president of Hindustan Construction Company. He's also the co-chair of the India Economic Summit. Montek Singh Aluwalia, the deputy chairman of the Planning Commission of India. Sanjeev Chadda, president of PepsiCo in India. And Harish Manvani is uh, the president of Unilever for Asia, Africa, Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you all very much for being here with us. Now, Montek, let's start with you. The government of India is responsible for formulating water policy in India. What is your assessment of the water situation in India and its water security? What are the issues which you think are crucial? Well, it's an important subject and, you know, we have a water policy, but actually we're reviewing it. I mean, like countries all over the world, uh, the awareness that water is going to be a critical constraint very much there in our planning process. I think water is quite special. I mean, I've often said that the water crisis is actually more serious than the energy crisis. And in both cases, you have the issue of uh, rapidly growing demand with limited supply. I mean, technically, you could say in the case of water that there's virtually no actual growth in supply. Uh, the water we have is the same as we had 5,000 years ago. Population has increased, GDP has increased, and all of this requires water. Uh, so how you bring these things uh, to equilibrium is a difficult task. And I think it's mainly difficult because in most other things, people are actually willing to pay a price for anything that's scarce. So people expect that if you want energy, you're going to have to pay for it. People don't actually think you have to pay for water. I mean, it's a widespread belief that it's a gift of God and it's a function of governments that they should make water available very, very cheap. Uh, if you do that, it's very difficult to uh, ration, to actually bring demand into balance with supply unless you start rationing water. So I think it requires a complete mindset change that if water is a scarce resource, it will have to be priced. We will have to support the poor, but that's a targeted effort. And this is not going to be easy. And I think more than in any other area, a rethinking of how do you manage water scarcity is going to be required. And that's not just true in India, it's true all over the world. Hi, thank you, Monte. Now, Ajit, you uh, run a very large construction company. What are your initial thoughts on the water situation in India and the role of infrastructure? Well, as Montek said, we have a water crisis. And as you pointed out, that, that India would be 50% short of its water requirements in 20 years' time. And whilst that's the bad news, the good news is that it is possible to resolve this. There are solutions for this. However, we need to understand here that in terms of understanding water, we use water very discriminately, indiscriminately, and therefore we have a crisis. Water is both, is, is considered only as a social good, whereas water is a social good, it is a commercial good, as well as an environmental good. For example, you need water for your drinking, which is a social good, but there's a lot of water that is being used for commercial use, including agriculture. And then, what about crowding out the rest of the environment? I mean, human beings use almost 50% of the total water, surface water. So I think it's important for us to understand that there are different uses of water and that we'll have to look at it. But before that, I think we, let's understand the use of water. 
And I'd like to ask the audience a question. How much water do you think an individual needs every day, an individual? What is the need of water of every individual? What does anybody supply you water every year, every day? Can somebody answer this question? Perhaps in the debate we could get back to yeah, that. Yeah, because it's yeah? very important yeah. to un sure. answer this sure. question yeah. in the sense that I will, even though that people have not answered, mm -hmm. I can assure you they never thought of a figure of 10,000 liters per day. Seven, seven and a half thousand out of that is the food you eat. About two and a half thousand is the manufactured products that you use. And only about 7% is what you drink and use for sanitation. So when you have this huge use for agriculture, India's major problem is agricultural water. We use it badly. We even give water free to the farmer. We give him electricity free to use that water. Israel, on the other hand, uses one-sixth the water the rest of the world uses for precision agriculture. So there's a lot of good news here that is possible to save and recycle water in order to do that. But we do have a crisis. We are not adequately aware of it, and we haven't created policy to address it. Right, thank you very much, Ajit. Now, um, Harish, you are from one of the biggest consumer companies in India. What is your view as a private sector person as to why the private sector should be involved in this whole water situation? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the, the peculiarity or the, or of water is that it's everyone's problem. And uh, uh, it's, not, it's not a problem of the government, the individual, uh, the companies. And uh, uh, let me th therefore focus on really what I believe corporates should be doing and why it's important uh, for everyone to sort of do their little bit. Uh, everyone talks about two areas of water that we have to manage, you know, the supply side and the demand side. I think there's a lot being said about the supply side. My own view is that, there is, that, that, that we have to really bring the consumer into play here because there's a demand side that's equally important. Now, why is a company like Unilever that sells soap and soup, how can it make a difference? I believe it can make a difference because there is an equation called small actions, big difference. We, Two billion people use our brands every day. 700 million households in India use a Unilever product, a Hindustan Lever product. If you can make people do that one thing, which is just a little better from a conservation point of view, you can imagine the big bang. Let me give you one example. Our approach, for example, is to say that we must be more holistic and look at, if you like, end-to-end -end, uh, uh, sustainability of everything that we do. What does that mean? If you look at the amount of water, for example, that we consume as a company, uh, our, our footprint, 65% of that is determined by the use of our products by consumers, to wash clothes, to bathe, so on and so forth. 25% is, is on the raw material end. We are one of the largest buyers of agricultural products. We buy, for example, 7.5 million tons of agriculture. So what are we trying to do here? What we are saying is, if you look at the supply side of it, which is sourcing of products, we want to make sure that water management is a very important criteria by which we will decide the suppliers of our raw materials. Okay, that's one end. On the consumer end, we believe there is a huge amount of exciting uh, initiatives that we can take because we deal with consumers every day. Take a simple product like the one we market in India called Surf Easy Wash, which saves two buckets of water for every time you wash. Take a product like Comfort Fabric Conditioner One Rinse in Southeast Asia, which uses basically one rinse instead of three rinses and saves 30 liters of water every wash. If everyone changed to these products, we could save 500 billion liters of water. So the point I want to really leave you with, I, but that's really the multiplier effect of a fast-moving consumer goods, because at the end, small actions, big difference. Thank you very much, Harish. That was a very persuasive argument and a bit of a commercial thrown in there. <laughs> now, turning now to Sanjeev. And now, Sanjeev, you are one of the biggest kind of beverage companies uh, in India. What kind of role do you see the private sector playing in finding solutions? Well, uh, Amrita, the fact is that uh, water is, as the other speakers have said, a universal problem, and it's a pressing issue for India. Uh, I remember a quote from Nelson Mandela, uh, which really struck a chord with me. And he said he was one of the things he learned during his presidency was the centrality of water. 
the fact that it has such an amazing impact on the social, political, economic fabric of the entire country, indeed the world. And uh, we see that happening and playing out in India as well. So for such a large issue, there is no question that no one organization, body, or indeed the government can do it alone. It calls for teamwork. And uh, while the government is the captain of this team, the private sector certainly is a key player as well. So what can the private sector do? I think the starting point, to be honest, is to take a mirror and look at themselves and ensure that wastewater which is generated is treated in its entirety. And today, we are far from that. About 60% of the wastewater is currently treated, and 40% is really polluting our aquifers. Having said that, there are three or four areas where the, uh, where the private sector can play a key role. Uh, and it stems from what the private sector stands for, professional management skills and specific competencies in their respective fields. So the first I'd say is, while policy, man, uh, policy makers understand that water is a key issue, the lay consumer does not. And therefore, really building a burning platform is where I believe it needs to start. So that's one. The second is in the area of really catalyzing water efficiency improvements in not only industry, but importantly in agriculture as well, which consumes 80% or more of our water. And we are pretty inefficient when it comes to water use in terms of agriculture. The third, I'd say, is leveraging our management practices to build two very critical areas, capability and capacity, uh, as far as the water sector in its entirety is concerned. And the last but not least, I'd say, there's some great work being done in small pockets across the country, across sectors. But very, very few people are even aware of that. So really giving it a tremendous amount of visibility and scale so that more and more people adopt those practices and reward and recognize those is something that the private sector can help in. Thank you, Sanjeev. Now, uh, Arjun, you're very familiar with uh, water issues across the region. Put this all in context for us. How is India doing in terms of its water situation compared to the rest of the region? Uh, not well at all, Amrita. Uh, I think if I can step back a bit and uh, post uh, a few numbers for our common benefit, uh, 1951, a few years after independence, we had a per capita water endowment of about 5,700 cubic meters. That has now declined to less than 1,700, which is the universally accepted norm for water stress. In fact, parts of India are much uh, worse than just water stress. We are water scarce. Tamil Nadu, for example, 400 cubic meters per capita. And this is projected to decline even further. In the next 10 years, we're going to come as a country below 1,000 cubic meters per capita. So I think the first order of business to see what is it that we can do as a country to not just uh, halt this decline, but in fact reverse it. It's important in terms of economic growth. It's important in terms of social equity. Now, if you take irrigated agriculture, which draws about 85% of our accessible freshwater uh, resources, India's irrigation efficiency, uh, defined again uh, in, a, in a universal sense, is about 25 to 30%. And almost everybody in else in Asia is way ahead of that figure. Not too way ahead, but ahead nonetheless. If you look at the urban water subsector, uh, we don't have any town or city in India. We have parts, enclaves of certain town cities, which have 24 by 7 service and uh, WHO standard uh, water quality. And again, here we're doing uh, much worse than anybody else. Uh, Southeast Asia is doing a lot better, Phnom Penh, Manila, Jakarta, Ho Chi Minh City, etc. If you look at wastewater management, that's going to be a big ticket item in the future, and which is again putting a lot of pressure on our freshwater resources, we are able to treat effectively about 10 to 15 percent of our wastewater. The rest is allowed to leach into water bodies and so on and so forth. And again, as I said, reduces the amount of water we have for consumptive purposes. If you uh, look at energy, which again, and I'm going to make uh, a plea here to all of us that we start thinking about water, energy, and food in the same breath, in the same vein, because these are very closely related. If, as a colleague of mine has said very pithily, Tony Allen, a former uh, Stockholm uh, Water Prize winner, that if you look at these three 
as a triangle with emotion and politics in the middle. That's exactly what the water conundrum is all about, which needs to be resolved. If you take energy, there is a recent HSBC report which says, along with the World Resources Institute, that 74,000 megawatts of capacity, new capacity in India, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, and Indonesia in the next seven years is going to be set up in water-stressed areas. Mm -hmm. So look at the risk premiums that will have to be paid to ensure investors in these thermal power stations. So again, I think it's important for us to see that we are going to have to pay a lot and in very quick time to be able to close the water gap of 50% that you referred to in your opening remarks. It's going to cost us. We don't have deep pockets, but then we have no other option. Now, Arjun, the statistics that you've described are obviously very sobering concern uh, with the situation in India. Now, you work fairly closely in terms of uh, advising the government of India or had discussions with them. Do you think the government of India has understood the true scale of the problem uh, as far as the water situation is concerned? And are they on the right track? You heard what Montek had to say. I think it has at various levels. If you look at the central level, I mean, Montek's... Uh, Planning Commission has just posted really recently its midterm appraisal of the 11th plan in regard to water. And I think the writing is very clear. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's abundantly evident to me, at least, that the problems have been identified and the approach to the 12th plan will have to be markedly different. If you look at the states, some are further ahead than others. Karnataka, for instance, uh, is certainly cognizant of what needs to be done in terms of a transformational water agenda over the next 20 years and has begun to take action. Uh, but again, this will have to be a combined effort. It will have to be the states as well as the center, enabling an environment framework from the center plus transformational action plans at state level. Now, Montek, uh, we've listened to what uh, Arjun had to say. Now, the Indian government has played a very positive role in ensuring water security over the past 150 years, largely in terms of infrastructure. But listening to the fact that we are expecting a gap of 50% between supply and demand in just 20 years, where do you think the major weaknesses lay in your policy which have resulted and are resulting in such a, a rapid depletion of water in the country? You know, first let me say that these estimates of 50% um, uh, deficit over the next 20 or 30 years really are not worth the paper they're written on because they are usually based on projections on business as usual. If you had made that projection in 1975 for food, you would have come to the conclusion that there won't be enough food. Uh, Malthus came to that conclusion for the whole world in the year 1700 and something. So, you know, long-term projections based on business as usual are really no, not much use except to say, this is a problem. And by the way, everybody recognizes that's a problem. So the real issue is, what are we going to do about it? Now, I think a couple of things we have to realize. First, probably we have to do much more on the demand side than the supply side. I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a sort of a mindset shift. Because usually, the approach is, uh, we've got a problem, we've got a shortage, produce more. I mean, for example, we don't say on food, that we somehow have to manage with less food. We say we've got to produce food. And similarly for many things. Not the same for energy, because we say we've got to manage the demand for energy. Water, maybe two or three times more, we should focus on the demand side. On the supply side, what we have to do is a huge variety of things. Most people think only of big dams, which is certainly important because it impounds water that otherwise runs out to the sea. But much more than that, is things like afforestation, is things like watershed management, groundwater recharge, a whole variety of things that the government in different dimensions has to do. And I think we are very clear about that. And we are ourselves thinking of essentially reorienting a public investment strategy to take care of these things. Um, Arjun mentioned, for example, treatment of wastewater. That's very, very essential. Uh, and certainly in the way in which our urban cities are organized, um, how much of the sewage is going to be treated before it's put back into the system? What happens to industrial effluent? You need a massive change because up to now, I mean, it's just not felt to be a sufficiently high priority. The other side of it is actually just plain efficiency. I mean, 80% of India's water is used for agriculture. 
And it's generally recognized that efficiency could be increased 100%. Now, if we could get to the most efficient use of water te techniques, agricultural techniques for using water, we could actually increase the available supply by something like 40% in one go. But the point is to do that, you need to do farming in totally different ways. And most important, somebody has to want to economize on water. But you know, if water is free, why should anyone economize on it? So it's the unviability of some of these very basic <laughs> things. I mean, they're realized. Uh, I've no doubt one way or the other that they will get injected back into the system. Uh, the issue is uh, how fast and how smoothly. So and that's what we plan. I mean, we are currently working with the Ministry of Water Resources on a new water policy, which actually looks at all these. I mean, it isn't done yet, so we are currently working on it. Okay, but so I think the 12th plan will outline a totally different approach. But Montek, so you're saying you might quibble about the numbers, whether the gap will be 50% or 25% or whatever, but you do acknowledge there's a serious problem. Uh, with what water do you mean scarce. Knowledge? We have been in the forefront of saying it's a serious problem. So, I mean, uh, there's absolutely no question about that. Okay, so we'll come to the uh, details in a bit. But, uh, Anish, before we do that, just before we, so we set the stage now, with India growing at about 9% or uh, close to 9%, hoping to grow till about 10% in the next couple of years, do you see a substantial increase in industry's demand for water? Sure. I think, I think the most important thing that you have to keep in mind is that India and developing countries must have a growth agenda. I think we would, unless you accept the fact that we have to talk about all our resources in the context that we need growth. We have two and a half billion people across the world who still don't have a basic uh, standard of living. They want good water, they want uh, you know, basic products available and so on and so forth. And I think once you accept the fact that growth is important and not stop wagging fingers at growth and consumption, and then you say, how do you, make, how do you actually have sustainable consumption or sustainable growth? I think you begin to find uh, uh, solutions. I agree with Montek because at the end of the day, you know, if you go back 25 years, we thought we'll never leapfrog into telecoms because we don't have landlines. And before you know, we are now one of the largest markets for, uh, for, for, uh, for telephony. Now, the point is that there is room here for innovation, and I think there is a lot of room for innovation in terms of efficiencies and so on, the supply side, I still believe we must hear the voice of the consumer and the demand side in this. I personally am not quite sure whether if you were to even ask that farmer, what is it that they need? Do they need to pay for their water but have absolute reliability of getting the water when they want it and the quality of water? I think that we, we are not understanding the economics of water. What we are understanding is, or what we are dealing with, is the emotion of water. And I do believe there's a lot of upside in terms of demand management. I understand a lot of other countries have done that, from Australia to Thailand and so many others who are addressing this, and I think it can be done. Innovation on the supply side and consumer behavior changes on the demand side. You talked about growth. Sanjeev, do you think scarcity of water is a business risk for you? I think it's a business risk for uh, the entire country. Most certainly, yes. Uh, I think the important point there is uh, to ensure, again, like uh, Montague and Harish have mentioned, that uh, we are efficient in the way we consume our water. We are responsible in the way industry manages the used water. And we are enterprising uh, and play the right role in terms of impacting a change in the wider spectrum. I'll give you one example of that, which is the industry's role in agriculture. Uh, Montek talked about the significant amount of efficiency, or inefficiency rather, in the agricultural system which consumes 80% of the water. Uh, one of the innovative practices that our scientists in PepsiCo have done is on paddy cultivation. Now, paddy, as you might be aware, consumes a huge amount of water. When you think about a paddy field, you think about flooded fields. You'll be amazed that one kilogram of rice requires 3,000 liters of water to produce. And what scientists have been working on with the Punjab Agricultural University is a new mechanism by which you avoid the puddling and are able to save as much as 30 to 40%. If half of the country is able to do puddling or direct seeding by that method, we would save more water than all industry today combined uses. So I think there are many different areas and means, but the core issue, honestly, is in terms of creating those 
collaborative partnerships to work together. And I think therein lies the issue. We all recognize the problem. Mm -hmm. We all recognize certain solutions which have worked in different mm -hmm. pockets. Mm -hmm. But the challenge has been to be able to take those forward in a much surer and faster way. And that is where I think the work lies. You've raised a lot of uh, very interesting issues, but the two things which stand out uh, very clearly and are here loud and clear is we must manage our demand better and through efficiencies, particularly in agriculture, because that consumes over 80% of India's uh, water. But Ajit, how does one manage demand? Well, uh, let's say when we looked at water and wanted to, to create a situation in our company, can we really conserve a lot of water? And in construction, we took a look at two things. One is while using water, can we recycle water and set ourselves the goals that every new project we now take, we will consume only 30%. And having succeeded with that, we'll move on to 20. We found to our astonishment that this very simple idea was so easily doable. In fact, so quickly was it possible to recycle water that the cost of equipment to recycle that water and to clean that water was re recovered in a period of three to four months. Then we came up with the idea of a positive structure, water positive structure. Now, what does water positive structure mean? It means that you create sufficient drains on the structure that you construct or build, mm -hmm. the facility that you build, that it recharges the groundwater when it, when it drains from the, from the structure. And so at a certain period in time after the structure is built, it starts contributing more than it has ever consumed to build it. So there are a variety of ways by which we found that construction can save water. We can actually come down to even 20% or 10% of the water we are using today, plus create these water positive structures to so continuously recharge water. So from a construction industry point of view, these are some of the innovative ways which you can use. Yes. Like like Israel uses drip irrigation. Yeah, uses but talking just, about yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, irrigation, I mean, we, we've been talking a lot about, and now uh, yeah. I want to stay with the bigger picture for a bit, Arjun. Now, is it worth our while to actually start thinking in terms of crop by drop models, where we actually assess what it costs, how much water it costs to produce certain crops, and that would necessitate actually certain economic reprioritizing mm. in the country? Oh, absolutely. I think what you're talking about is water footprinting. And I think that uh, analogy from the, uh, from the energy sector and carbon footprint and so on must get into water. But I'd like to go back, if you don't mind, to this whole question of demand management. I think it's very interesting. And uh, certainly our focus is right in that we are saying that the pendulum perhaps has swung too far out in, in favor of foreign bias towards supply side. And it's not that supply side has to be ignored. We do need storages. That's important but we need to be efficient about our supply side operations. But demand side requires, as Montek said, pricing. I mean, you have to have an economic value on, 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 on water. Otherwise, as he said, if, if water is free, you don't really worry about it. Leave your taps open, you leave the floodgates open and the fields. How is it that we are going to be introducing economic pricing of water in this country? I am particularly concerned because I don't think we we look at water as an economic good. We are always hung up about using water as a social good. I think the two have to go together, which is why I spoke about economic growth as well as social inclusiveness. I think one clear example is uh, in the urban sector, for example, autonomy, a business outlook. Wherever it's been tried in Asia, whether under auspices of the state or the private sector or in any part kind of partnership between the two, it has worked and everybody has won, the consumer, who Harish was talking about, the, 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 the urban local government or the other local government, and the agency. Why is it that we in India cannot get to grips now with a whole range of good practice, best in class examples from within Asia, forget the rest of the world? Montek, two important issues. One is pricing, and the other being, why don't we have these kind of partnerships you see in certain other countries? Talking first about pricing, it's a highly volatile issue here in India. As you said, most people are very used to getting uh, water at a very heavily subsidized rate and using it, drawing water out with uh, subsidized electricity. How difficult will it be for you and you've said this repeatedly, you, there should be a more rational pricing of water. How difficult will it be for you to actually put that through, get that through uh, with the public? Well, I think water pricing will be difficult. I don't think it's impossible, by the way. 
You know, what most people don't realize is that uh, in an urban area, water has to be priced, not just to cover the cost of getting the water. It should be priced to cover the cost of treating the sewage. Because as a matter of fact, that is the only way in which you can pay for the sewage. And most people don't sort of focus on that. And yet, um, you don't need to focus on it if you're a very small population and the sewerage isn't really making much of a difference to your rivers. But when you've got to our size of population, I mean, people have to recognize that in urban households, they will be, and you know, it's a very straightforward thing. The amount of water you use is directly correlated with the amount of sewage you generate. So you basically pay for both, that's first thing. Second, it's not true, by the way, that private partnerships have not been tried. There are many examples, there are micro examples, where bringing in, I mean, municipalities and urban local bodies have actually achieved 24 by seven water supply. So the examples are there, we're late in coming to it, that's true. Uh, and I mean, once it becomes recognized that this is probably the only way that you're gonna get 24 by seven coverage, I've no doubt that it'll spread, but it'll require some political leadership that people will have to, I mean, there's a presumption, you know, that if the state could subsidize the whole thing, I mean, it could be free, but given the many other things the state has to do, there is, in my view, absolutely no justification for subsidizing what is perfectly possible, by the way, to have a metering system where, let's say, if you're concerned about the poor, that the first slab uh, that you charge is very, very low. But, you know, beyond that, you not only charge, but you get them to cross-subsidize the poor. So if you're going to wash your car uh, with water, pay the price for it. No, it's a and this is, But let me say, yeah. the yeah. urban middle class, mm. the urban intellectuals, mm. I would even say industry, mm. have not done their job to publicize this. There's always talk of efficiency, there's talk of rational. They don't get up and say, India's urban areas need to pay more for the water that comes out of the tap. And I think when that is recognized and when thought leaders push for it, I mean, it wouldn't be easy, but at least it'd be one step forward. You know, civil society organizations very often uh, focus on the need to ration water. I mean, they say that somebody is using too much water. You can't ration water. You can't sort of say you're going to use only so many milliliters or something. It needs to be focused on the price. The other thing, by the way, is on crops. I don't think crop planning, I mean, this is not a, you're not running a Stalinist agriculture. <laughs> you have to just price the water. Yeah. Uh, if you price the water, they will not grow sugarcane. <coughs> but if you provide water free and say, don't grow sugarcane, I'm not sure how you can do it. So, I mean, there's, there's a very fundamental problem here. Now, you can, you can ration water if you set in regulatory mm -hmm. systems. And Maharashtra, for example, has done that. But you know, you, you take an entire irrigation system mm -hmm. and you have to make it very plain to farmers that you're gonna make sure that people all along the system are gonna get the water mm -hmm. and there's gonna be so much water and you're gonna get this much of it and no more. And you sure. can't grab it just because you're nearer the uh, upper it. end of the... If people know that yes, you've put in a regulatory system, yeah. then I think they'll realize that you can't grow sugarcane. But then the answer is they'll know how much water they're getting. So exactly what Harish so was saying. So you get the value yeah, of, of the water. There will be certainty, mm -hmm. and then they will know that you, you know, this crop will yield a bigger result. So there's a lot that can be done. Sure. And I think um, the point the about things, uh, uh, rice is uh, crucial. Yeah, but one of the things that you talked about, there has been some amount of collaboration with the private sector, and yet the water sector is chronically underfunded. What would you like to see from the government to make businesses or the industry get involved in the water sector, which is till now kind of really risky for uh, most people, that, but they feel they will not get the returns. What would you like to, Bontek is here, what would you like from the government? So firstly, what I'd say is that while definitely uh, the water sector requires investment, mm. I don't think that is the number one issue or challenge that we are facing. Uh, the amount involved, again, as I understand it, is reasonable and it's not outside our means. Uh, I think what is required is, again, a mechanism by which there is certainty in terms of water policy going forward. Today it is a political subject. Mm -hmm. And that polit political subject is what creates a vulnerability. If you invest in X, three years later it becomes Y. Point number one. Point number two, I think, to the point that the other gentleman made, while water is most definitely a human right, 
I think what is not recognized fully and acknowledged is the importance of the economics of water. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is indeed for businesses, whether private or public sector, it is important for them to get a reasonable return on the investment that they are making, not just first off, but on an ongoing basis. And that's what I hear from water utilities as being a major constraining factor. The third thing I'd say is an A to Z accountability. That is very, very important. Now, water is very intricate in that there are many different organizations involved. There are as many as 14 ministries on last count which are involved in water, 14. And which is why it's very important to have the ability of providing proper accountability right from sourcing the water to distributing it, treating it, getting someone to pay for it as well. And I think a great example of that is Singapore. Singapore has something called the PUB, the Public Utilities Board, which was set up 10 years back. And they're a shining example of what an organization or a country can do, small albeit, but great relevant learnings for us as well, in terms of really driving towards water sufficiency. Today, one of the issues on policy that we have mm. is that it's riddled with paradoxes. Mm. As again, some of the gentle, gentlemen mentioned. Mm. On the one hand, pricing is an issue. On the other hand, guess who's paying the maximum for water? It's the poorest person. Yeah. That's right. Most of the subsidies tend to kind of uh, often help. And, and that is what well needs to be solved farmers. for. Yeah, that's one of the issues. We're talking a, a little bit is about industry, Harish. Now, um, the industry is at one level creates, you know, you have large industrial users, miners, leathers, metals, which is contributing a lot to uh, the pollution of uh, water sources. At the same time, the industry, do you think there is enough focus within the industry on providing innovative solutions to deal with things like agricultural uh, productivity, things like sprinkler irrigation, things like um, um, micro-intensive uh, irrigation? I think there is a lot more awareness uh, uh, about working together in this whole area. I think there is more awareness or more willingness to work together in this area than perhaps any other. Because I think everyone sees the benefit. I think Ajit gave a very good example of how each company has absolutely top of their priority, how do we not just become water neutral but water positive. And, and, and I don't think there are many exceptions. There are exceptions, I'm not saying there are not, but there are not many. And I think ultimately it's a question of where you start and where you end. It's all about continuous improvement. That's the other thing I want to talk about. You know, we believe in this big bang theory. We'll wake up tomorrow morning, all the problems are gone. PPP is work, public-private partnership is work together. It doesn't happen like that. But there must be continuous improvement in here. And I do believe it works. I just want to say one thing. I heard in the morning there was another discussion going on, something very interesting, which I didn't know. Coimbatore is water positive. And my point is, very much like industry, if only everybody knows what the world knows about water. We know enough. The question is, are we really harnessing it to make sure that everybody knows what has to be done? And I think that is a challenge, by the way. How do we make that happen? And the second bit about pricing water. What's the big issue? When you start with something that's free, it's difficult to price it. Okay? When you start something with a price, it's difficult to take a price increase. And again, if I can give a humble example of how uh, a lot of consumer good businesses, whether they are selling automobiles or scooters or, or soap, do it. Every time you want to ask people to pay more, you have to give them a value or a reason why. And I think the most important reason why in this case is we will guarantee you a quality of water and consistency of water the way you like it. I don't think people want to use more water. People have need for water. And I think we must separate these two out and I believe that we can take the tough step if we can promise a proposition here, which is, yes, we will charge for water, but this is not the same water you were getting. By the way, you can drink it. How about that? So do you think, actually, efficiency, whether it's from the private sector or whether it's from government policies, is the key to any kind of reform in the water sector, that people are prepared to pay so long that they're guaranteed an efficient supply of water, clean water uh, supply? All I'm saying is, sorry, were you asking? I'm sorry. I mean, uh, yeah, maybe we'll no, ask no. Uh, no, Arjun. Yeah? Un unqualified, yes. I mean, that's the, that's the way of the world. That's how it's happening in the rest of Asia. Now, one of the stakeholders we haven't kind of mentioned, and we've talked about islands of success within India, 
the non-governmental organizations have often community-based organizations have been very successful in small areas of India uh, in managing in a sustainable uh, way water resources there. Do you think it is critical that in any kind of policy implementation, any kind of project, that ownership has to be given to the people who are using the resource? Montek? Uh. No, I, I'm very much in favor of that. I mean, uh, Indian experience does show that um, at a watershed level or a limited watershed level, uh, remarkable things can be done by doing water conservation, encouraging groundwater recharge, etc. Uh, and I think the experience does show that where people are aware that this is going to lead to a benefit and they actually own and are involved in the scheme. It doesn't mean the government has no role. Government can fund it, help, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no doubt that the balance of uh, community involvement and participation. When we say community, I mean, it could be community. It could be the elected local councils, what we call the panchayats. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be civil society. It has to be society, helped by civil society, maybe with the elected uh, local bodies in the lead. I think the evidence shows in many states of India, certainly in parts of Rajasthan, in Gujarat, in Madhya Pradesh, uh, the success achieved has been remarkable. But it needs to now be spread out. And you know, we have many rural development programs, like for example, the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee, which actually basically provides a lot of money to give people jobs who need it up to a certain amount. Now, if, if these uh, jobs could be used in order to create these highly productive water conserving assets, it would make a huge difference. And at the moment, the guidelines for this scheme do say that water conservation has the highest priority. But it's a question of designing the right schemes, putting them in place, monitoring them, Ensuring you know, a the government has this wonderful water users associations, but from what I can see that they are a, largely ineffective and that's partly because they're not financially empowered to take decisions at the local level. But before we go on, there are just two other issues that I need to raise because we are running out of time. And one of them is on the pollution. The pollution of our water sources. Ajit, how much do you think that is contributing to the scarcity of water in India? That we have these huge rivers, but there's 80% of India's urban waste is going into these rivers. Is that a huge issue? What are the obstacles to dealing with the pollution of our, our pollute, uh, pollution of our water sources? Oh, certainly it is an issue because when you pollute water and it can't be reused, that's where you run into difficulty. In fact, sometimes when you use too much insecticide, also you create the same situation. So cleaning up that water is an exceedingly important feature of reusing it. That's why wastewater treatment if it is done to almost 100% of it, then you can practically use 25% of the total water usage, which goes for industrial use, back into circulation. Mm. What I feel at this moment, but besides this, at this stage, I think there has to be a greater awareness of the, how much water that we need, how are we using it, in order for some policies to emerge, in order to people are prepared to pay for it. For example, if all you think is you're going to, you need water for your sanitation and for your drinking in the city, you're wrong. There is a farmer who produces your food and he's using a water which actually is your consumption. I think till people get aware of the total consumption that they themselves are causing of water and how they, they would demand reduction in it. One is recycling of waste, recycling of drinking and sanitation water. And even maybe demanding that the water used in the food you supply me is less. So do you think there's not enough awareness, public awareness, Absolutely. about just the scale of the problem at the moment? Maybe it is because of pricing, maybe yes. But today, mm. public awareness of the use of water is very, very low. As I said, that's why I asked that first question. I don't, I don't, I don't quite agree that it's a matter of public awareness. Of course, public awareness is low. Mm. But you know... Let's look at this specific issue of uh, industrial pollution. I think that's just ineffective regulation. And quite honestly, uh, when you're polluting, uh, the issue is not pricing. It's actually putting in place very tough regulation. If we were to run a system in which it would, maybe you'd have to take a few years to put the thing in place and introduce really stiff penalties, my guess is that within a few years, maybe two or three years, 
uh, compliance by most of the large industries in not doing the pollution would rise very substantially. But you've got to do that. And it's not something the central government can do. It, it's in the realm of state governments, the, the state pollution control boards. But you've got to remember that when you do that, it is going to be costly. So it's going to reflect itself in the cost structure of the economy. So one way or the other, I think we have, what the people have to realize is that there are lots of other good things that are happening. Uh, part of the growth process is that you must pay for all these things. And companies that can depollute cheaper will have an advantage, and companies that can't won't. And there will be an economic structure change. So uh, a very we big role, very big role for is tightening yeah. up yeah. regulation mm. and just enforcing it. Mm. Um, I think if we do that, what you would find, at least amongst the larger companies, which are the more visible, not because they're more moral, they're more visible, uh, the civil society organizations would target them for performance, one would realize very suddenly that if all these guys can become water positive, the question will be, why not the middle? And by the way, there are cases in India where in smaller towns, in clusters, people have risen to this challenge and actually done a good job. But I mean, and the same thing is true of uh, s pollution via sewerage. Mm. I mean, it's very clear that this is the city, whatever it is, all over our major rivers, that is doing the pollution, and you just need to enforce, uh, you know, introducing the technologies that would prevent that from Amita, happening. If no, they're there. Add, sorry. Yeah, sorry. If I may just actually uh, wrap, uh, we are drawing uh, to a close to our thing. Uh, Arjun, looking at it, there's no dearth of ideas, as you see. Everybody's committed. There's great talk about working together, partnerships. Now, you work very closely with water. You are an, an international pundit on water, if I may say so. Now, um, what do you think would be the price for India if it does not deal with water scarcity as an urgent issue right now? I think it would certainly impact on growth. It would certainly impact on quality of life. If you just look at cities as drivers of economic growth, cities which lack world-class water infrastructure are obviously not going to be the same as cities that do have that kind of infrastructure. And I think it's very important to learn lessons from what's happening around us. Uh, Montek was talking about wastewater and the cost there being very high. Certainly, look at China's case. China's likely to have half the kind of water gap that India and half the total aggregate consumption that India has by 2030. That's not uh, getting to the degree of numbers, Monte. But to get to closing that gap is going to cost China four times as much as India, conservatively, simply because China's problem is water quality. India's problem is efficiencies in irrigated agriculture. So that's the kind of very important lesson I think we need to learn as we are beginning to, 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 to rapidly urbanize and rapidly industrialize. And if enforcement is not going to be happening soon, it's going to also have an impact on investment. And which is why I would make a plea that wastewater is an area where markets ought to be created, where investments from others than governments, which are either unwilling or unable to make them, should be allowed and should be encouraged. And wastewater should not just be wastewater treatment, be treated as a resource because it can be reused. And that's a very good note, I think, to uh, end the kind of formal uh, part of the debate. Now, we have about 10 minutes. I'd hope we'd have about 20 minutes for uh, questions, but we have 10 minutes left. And, and I think, I mean, you'll all agree with me that these were very stimulating ideas and discussions among the various uh, contenders. They've thrown up various issues. Water is a very broad subject. We've only been able to touch um, a few of the issues which uh, need addressing as a part of solutions that we need to deal with India's impending water scarcity. Now, may I ask people of the audience if any of you would like to ask questions, and if you do, please identify yourself. And if your question is addressed to any specific panel member, uh, please name the person you would like to ask the question. And may I request the people who are holding the mics to actually rush as quickly as possible to the person so we have um, as much of, uh, kind of, we can do that quite fast. The gentleman there in the tie there with uh, spectacles. Thank you. I'm actually from jewelry manufacturing. Can you speak up a bit, please? Yeah. yeah. Uh, as you said, introduce. So my name is Kapil Nevatia. I'm from a jewelry manufacturing company in Bombay. Uh, my question is to Mr. Aluwalia and Mr. Thapan. So that, that is, uh, can you speak into the mic? Just I'm hold sorry. it horizontal. Is this better? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. 
Um, we're talking about a water shortage. Uh, if I could compare water to power, there is uh, wastage and there is uh, emphasis on renewable energy. Um, does the Planning Commission with the relevant ministries have any uh, emphasis planned out on desalination for agricultural use, uh, cheaper inland transportation, and uh, coastal cities using more renewable water? You know, uh, there's lots of studies that have been done on the issue of uh, closing the gap between supply and demand. And you can conceive of a number of things that operate on the supply side and a number of things that operate on the demand side. And logically, you should use the start with least cost per unit liter. Desalination is the most expensive way of closing any gap. So certainly <coughs> in some parts of the country, uh, it would be logical to use it. And certainly, uh, you know, India ought to be in it as, if nothing else, to be familiar with the technology. But uh, there are too many other lower cost options for the overwhelming majority of the country to actually be thinking of desalination on economic grounds. I agree with that. Thank you. Anyone? Yeah. The gentleman uh, in the tie there, in the gray suit, Anna. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to make sure that there's some discussion between the interface of water and women. Uh, water and? And women. women. Ah. Yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased we, you asked that. We know and we see yeah. that when there is a gap between demand and supply, uh, there's a differential impact between men and women. Women suffer most, they pay most. Now that you have mentioned that a new water policy is being formulated, my interest is to learn how this formality is kind of taking stock of what the implication of this policy would or would not be on women, and how would the women's situation be addressed through the new policy vis-a-vis -vis water? Well, you know, we are adopting an extremely inclusive approach and in inviting both men and women to give us input. So we're not, we're not discriminating in favor of one or the other, but we are very aware that in, in certainly all the rural areas, the overwhelming burden of getting water falls on women. And therefore, anything that leads to an easing of access to drinking water would be hugely more beneficial for the women. And as a matter of fact, the way this gets reflected in uh, decision making is that in the local elected village councils, the panchayats, I mean, there's a, now almost a 50% reservation for women in most states. So there are a lot of women present. And we expect that uh, since these are the councils that determine how money at the local level should be used, that they will sooner or later be using their numerical strength to make sure that schemes that deliver water uh, would receive priority. Lots of people. Should we turn this on? There's a lady at the back, since we're talking about gender, the lady with glasses on her hair. Please. On rain harvesting. Yeah, I mean, that's speaker. clearly one of the, the well-established methods of conservation of water. And, you know, we're trying to encourage that everywhere. Traditional methods, to just to take from that, traditional methods of conserving water have been neglected uh, within yes, India? To some extent, this did happen in India. Because when we took over with central planning, a lot of promises were made by governments that we will provide you with water. The villages were managing a lot themselves. They stopped managing it. And we are now restoring that. And you are finding good results wherever it has come through. But you know, you must remember, at the end, in India, the majority of your water distress is coming from agriculture. Mm -hmm. So one of the best ways to save water in India is to import all your food. And you will need that much less water. In fact, but the very good thing is talking about water footprint. India has a very good record because only 2% of India's water is uh, an external water footprint. So India's doing really well there. In Japan, it's 65%. So I think that's a very good point to mention that we're doing really well on that. Most well, of our food is produced at home. The one thing, though, which can be done in terms of rainwater harvesting is, again, going back to policy, you know, some of the regulatory work where we can mandate uh, rainwater harvesting and such like techniques being an integral part, for example, of the building industry and similarly other such, to integrate our but development with responsible water use. 
Very you good know, point. Can I just one, actually one, let one. the people ask? Sorry, Mr. Gulakchand. I just want to um, get one of the people to ask. Let, let me, is there no one this side? Okay, let me ask the gentleman there. Yes, with short hair. With short hair. Short hair. <laughs> 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 All right, okay. <laughs> well, I'm Sorry, so happy. we'll come to you after this. Yeah. See, based on the statistical data, the Indian's water consumption is a very low even including the wastage. One of the main problems coming is supply side is the main, main issue. Especially, I'm very happy about the Did you see that Vice the Indian standing. water consumption is very low? You mean... Uh, the, uh, the worldwide, if you take the water consumption ratio yeah. per, per head, mm -hmm. it's a very low. So, um, it's 3% for uh, um, domestic use. Now, do you have a question oh, you would like to address to someone at the panel? Well, my question is, the supply side is the main issue. Mm -hmm. Whether the, most of the problem is coming with the failure of the monsoon. And rural area, most of the area, the water supply is not available. Even if there's somebody want to drink the water, and the, even the government is giving the water tanks, but you don't get the supply to fill that phone to provide the water. And who, is that who the- Who would you any, like uh, to have that question answered from? What by? is the question? Yeah. Not a question. Um, the question is uh, obviously that there's uh, not enough being done in rural India. You, you don't have Availability water. to the water. Oh. Availability to the water. Yes. Yeah. And your question being? The availability to the water is the main issue, not the wastage and other things. That, that is also true to be corrected. To okay. the availability of the water to bring it, what the steps can be taken and uh, what the initiatives can mm -hmm. be taken. Okay. So I think that was, uh, we'll take that as a comment rather than a question that the availability of water is an issue and not enough discussion has taken place on that. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure the panelists have taken note. Now could we have the gentleman uh, sitting next to you? He's answered your question. Okay, good. Can I have this gentleman there with a mustache? Thank you. Uh, my name is Christian. I'm from Novozymes. Mm -hmm. I didn't see much of uh, the role of biotechnology mm -hmm. in the conserve of uh, water. I feel that, especially, of course, there was a touching point from Mr. Manwani mm -hmm. about using his detergent powder mm -hmm. to reduce the rinse wash, but I think probably it could be even more better and understand biotechnology's role. Right, thank you very much. That's again a comment that there should be more technology. And I think um, that is one of the questions I think the industry people particularly have to look at. Is there enough R&D in water issues taking place? Now, I want to move away. There's another lady. Let's have a gender balance there. Yes, you? <laughs> uh, hello, Anjali Ravel, Financial Times newspaper. Um, just a factual thing. What, has, what targets have the government set for the next five years and for the next 10 years? Because as much as these ideas are very good, I'd like to know what's being done in practice. Oh, I didn't get that. What, what are the targets? Yes, targets, targets, for, targets the for the government has set for the, for the next, next five, five years. and ten years? Well, you know, as I said, we are we're coming to the end of the what we call the 11th five-year plan, which finishes in the year 2012. The next five-year plan begins in the year 2013. So we are working towards that, and therefore targets will be set before the plan period starts. A lot of the focusing on water-related issues and the targets uh, associated with that will be part of the 12th plan, but we're still working on it, so there are no targets at the moment that I can share. Can I just add to that? I think this is a really important question. At the end, you get what you measure and your targets. Just to tell you, and I'm sure that all my colleagues sitting here and many here will agree, as a company also, we have a very clear target. For example, we talk about doubling our business, we're talking about reducing our environmental impact end to end. And this is something that we are going to be announcing formally tomorrow because we think unless we commit ourselves and also give you a metric by which you can measure our impact. And many companies are coming forward to say, hold us responsible for this. Is what, for, for this. But the important thing is it has to be in the context of growth. That's right. We'll leave it there. Uh, thanks very much, Harish. Can we have the gentleman with the striped shirt? We have time for two more questions. Uh, we're just going to have the gentleman with the striped shirt there, and then one more question after that. Yes, hello, my name is Thomas Seifert. Uh, I work for the Austrian Daily Newspaper, Die Presse, and I have a question because you brought up uh, Israel. So uh, apart from that, the geopolitics of water has been absent from this discussion, and uh, we all know that the Tibetan plateau plays a pretty big role in, in the rivers that flow through China and also India. 
So please, could you, I don't know who wants to take up on the question, uh, comment on uh, how the water scarcity might actually evolve into kind of water conflicts in this region? Could we ask Arjun to answer that? I mean, 10 major rivers from the Tibetan plateau feeding a quarter of the world's population in Asia, um, and no discussion of that. What would you like to I certainly think we're going to have to be mindful of the fact that there is uh, potential for conflict uh, in the Himalayan basins. Uh, but I think uh, we also need to take heart from arrangements such as the Indus Waters Treaty, which has done very well for both India and Pakistan over 50 years or more now. So I think what we really need to work on is uh, simple but effective arrangements for transboundary water management. 40% uh, or more of our accessible freshwater resources globally, and about the same figure for Asia, are in shared river basins. So there's no getting away from the fact that with urbanization, with industrialization, with higher intensities in terms of pollution, you will have to be looking for more effective ways of collaborating across countries, across boundaries. Okay, one final question, the lady at the back in a white jacket. Hi, I'm Preeti. I teach at British School, and this question comes from my students. It's a very simple question. And even I don't know the answer since my childhood. Uh, at the same time, we have droughts in one part of the country, and at the same time, we have floods in another part of the country. Can't we have any system which can channelize the water or have a free flow, and we have some good water resources, and also we can save some funds for natural calamities? Who would like to answer that? Ajit, do you want to say something? I, it's better, you know, using um, flood waters as an asset, using no, waters well, there. Wait, one moment, this is beyond me. One okay. take. <laughs> okay, there's general consensus. Not, uh, it's not I, often that. I'm not okay. sure. Yeah. Let's do. Are you suggesting that if we have a drought in one part of the country and uh, scarcity in another part, 1,200 kilometers away, that we should be channeling the surplus water wherever it happens to arise? to the deficit, wherever it is, that's not going to be possible. I mean, the truth is, uh, we have to recognize that in every watershed, there is variability of water. And water security for that watershed has to be worked out knowing what the objective likelihood of variability is. I think what underlies your question is that you cannot, in the country, guarantee equality of access to water. Because if uh, the Lord has not given equality of access to water, you're not going to be able to change that. But the thing is that there, there, there are sensible ways of managing water. And one of the interesting implications of what you say is that water, the pricing of water should not be uniform across the country. Correct. This is very difficult to establish. Because most people think, well, it's one country, so the price of Everything else is more or less the same. Why not the price of water? And the short answer is because water can't be transported very easily from one part of the country to the other. You know, these are just uh, technical peculiarities. But let me say that I think 90% of our problems do not arise because of the inability to handle these subtleties. 90% of the problems are staring us in the face. And if we were to handle these, these other more sophisticated kinds of problems we'll handle in the next two decades from now. Most of the problems we have, we know what to do with, and if we can get that done, which is not easy because it requires people to recognize that there's no simple silver bullet type of answer, and whatever it is, it's going to cost. Of course, most people think that if it's going to cost, the cost should be borne by the government. And that's just not going to be feasible. Right. Uh, and that's, that's the key issue. Well, I mean, that's why we are trying to bring out uh, a new water policy. I mean, there are kind of, mention was made of Israel. There are countries that have managed to bring about an efficiency of water use, which is very, very high. We may not actually need to be that efficient in water use, because maybe we are not that water scarce. But we have to be a lot more efficient. And Certainly. the solution will be different across the country. I mean, clearly, in West Bengal and Bihar, where in totality there's a lot of water, you don't have the same problem that you have in Rajasthan. 
And at that, we have to leave it, Monte. Thank you very much for that. That was, I hope that answered your question. Well, I'm sorry we can't take any more questions. What's been very clear in this debate, that there is general agreement that there is a problem in the water situation of India. There's also broad agreement that urgent action needs to be taken in, the ter in terms of implementation and policy, in terms of getting the private sector involved, in terms of drawing on local organizations in effect, getting a collaborative effort in dealing with an impending water scarcity, not just in India, but in the world. You are watching the World Economic Forum DWTV debate coming to you from Delhi in India. I'm Amrita Chima. Great to have you with us. Thank you.